Today's message is part five of our current series titled Training in Righteousness. We have dealt with three courses already that David had to undergo in order for the cracks in his life to be mended and in the character flaws to be healed. God took him through those courses and I would take you to the fields where he had his practical training so that you know that God is not going to leave you untrained. He does not use untested vessels. In course number one, I told you that David discovered eight principal things that God is to a well-trained righteous man. I mentioned that like two times. As I studied this week, I discovered there were nine. And you know me. If I discover, I come back to you and said, I said eight before, is now nine. I was studying the same passage and I jumped only one word, the Savior. Because he called him the horn of my salvation. I just thought that is covered. But I saw the Savior written in capital with capital S. And I knew immediately that what David needed was a savior, not just a teacher. Because if you're not saved, you continue in your sin. What a sinner needs is a savior. And David, now you know there are nine. David got to know these nine qualities, nine attributes of God and who he is to a well-trained person in righteousness. Second Samuel chapter 22, verse 1 to 4. Second Samuel 22, 1 to 4. This was a verse I was reading to my friend in Abuja. I'll get to the very location of the prophecy, and I trust God to release me to bring forth the word. Then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of how many? All his enemies. And from the hand of Saul, may your principal mortal enemy and all his supporters, may God deliver you from their hands in the name of Jesus. And he said the following nine things about God. It was in the course of his trial, the course of his training, that this revelation of who God is became his. Every time you see Jehovah this, Jehovah that, it's because of an experience that someone had just encountered. God does not show up and say, this is my name, this is my name. No, 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 no. When Abraham saw the ram that was provided, it was not God who said, I am Jehovah Jireh. It was Abraham who called the place Jehovah Jireh because God made provision before the need ever arose. And David said, the Lord is my Rock, say one. one. Am my fortress? Two. My deliverer? Three. The God of my strength? Four. In whom I will trust? My shield? Five. And the horn of my salvation? Six. My stronghold? Seven. My refuge? Eight. My savior? Nine. You save me from violence. It is that savior that I join. Do you understand me? And how did, I, how did the Lord take me back there when I saw the nine different places God took him to? I realized that there was a reason for every field where he had practical training to become a righteous man that he became. You won't see David and say he was righteous. You won't see him and say he was blameless. But we have record that all these attributes became his because God gave him instructions and training in righteousness. And then he sang, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Verse number five. And in verse number five, why were this revelation of these nine attributes, nine attributes of God revealed to him? Because he was surrounded with waves of death. The floods of ungodliness made him afraid. 
the sorrows of hell and the snares of death also surrounded and confronted David. It was in the course of this confrontation, being surrounded by Sheol, being confronted by death, that he began to see what God could do for those he truly delights in. In my distress, I call upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry entered his ears. Then the earth shook. I can read the rest of that. That's cause two. When he had discovered the attributes of God for those he delights in, when the enemy came against him, when death encountered him, when Sheol surrounded him, when he was in the distress with a flood of ungodliness, he found out who God is. May you find out God in your situation. May you find out who God is in your circumstances. So that when the day comes that you should be afraid again, you say, no, I remember what you did before. The same God who did it before can do it now. He delivered him from his enemies and he will yet deliver you from yours. Cause number two. In cause number two, we discovered that God removed heaven and the earth in order to deliver those he delights in. It does not matter what happens if he had to move the whole of heaven and the whole of the earth just to deliver those he delights in, God would do it. I started law rebate. And concerning English law, the English will tell you the arm of the English law is long enough to protect every British, British citizen anywhere. America will not say so, may not say so, but you know they will protect their own citizen. Go and ask Idi Amin in Uganda. When they kept some Americans there, I mean Israelis, I beg your pardon, Israel flew there, delivered them, and it was a younger brother of the prime minister who led that particular uh, rescue mission, and he was the only one who died. Do you understand me? They're willing to lay down their lives for their citizen. May we not just die like cockroach here. Almighty God will move both heaven and earth in order to deliver those he delights in. If God delights in you, it does not matter if you are stranded now. He's coming to fetch you from there. He's coming to deliver you from there. In the mighty name of Jesus. I love Psalm 124, but I don't have time to read it. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, I like the conclusion. He said, the snare is broken and our souls are escaped from the snare snare of the fowler. May every snare of the fowler in your life be broken, be shattered, be dismantled in the name of Jesus. Second Samuel chapter number 22 verse 17 to 20. It will show you that God will move heaven and earth to deliver those he delights in. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He also brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Almighty God will move heaven and earth just to deliver those he delights in. Can I hear? Amen. Amen. In course number three, we saw David displaying his interim report of all that God did for him. Course number three for David. Second Samuel 22, 21 to 25. Second Samuel 22, 21 to 25. In the course of his training, he received some interim reward or interim report or testimonia of his dealing, God's dealings with him. And he, he said, the Lord rewarded me according to my, I mean, somebody please talk to me. The righteousness of David, how did he come by it? 
We're going to find out. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness, the cleanness of my hands. He has recompensed me. For I've kept the ways of the Lord. I've now wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me. And as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also blameless before him. And I kept myself from my iniquity. When I got here last Sunday, I began to celebrate self-restraint, self-control. So therefore the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness, in his eyes. Not in the eyes of people, but in the eyes of God. He said, the Lord God Almighty had enabled me through my training and the study of the word to restrain myself from my iniquity. That it is possible for you to overcome sin. It is possible to, for you to overcome besetting sins. It is possible for you to get to the place of self-control, self-restraint from everything that militates against you. Now I realize that whenever you pray for God to give you patience, is given to you in the midst of trials. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse trials. So when you are teaching about restraint, all kind of things will break forth to see whether you can control yourself or you can give the Lord praise. <laughs> give the Lord praise. It is clear from the testimony of David that the way you respond to God is the way God responds to you. Hello. When things happen, some will react, others will respond. The way you respond shows your maturity, that you have been trained in righteousness, and you know how to act just as Jesus will act. David said so in 2 Samuel 22, 26 to 27. Listen to him. With the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With a blameless man, you will show yourself blameless. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. And with the devious, you will show yourself shrewd. Now, you know me. When I read such a thing, with the devious, you will show yourself shrewd. I need a clarity. My English is not that good. So I decided to go to New Living Testament to give me the interpretation of what he just said. New Living Testament, verse 27, second Samuel 22, verse 27. To the wicked, God shows himself hostile. I just don't want to read things and sweep them. I want to understand what is it. To the wicked, God shows himself hostile. The Bible says God is angry with the wicked daily. My understanding of the word of God is that the opposite of righteousness is not just unrighteousness. The opposite of righteousness is wickedness. Are you righteous or wicked? God the Father affirmed the same thing to Eli the priest. That the way you respond to him is the way he will respond to you. He sent an unknown man of God to go warn him of his excesses. My God. Look at the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel 2, 27 to 36. Strong word. The way you respond to God is the way he responds to you. Then the man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord. Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, and to swear to wear an effort before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? Why do you kick at my sacrifice? If you think the offering taken every time in the church is for the pastor, you better watch out. Is his offering, is his sacrifice. Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I've commanded in my dwelling place? And honor your sons more than me to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father will walk before me forever. But now I say, I change my mind. Now the Lord says, far be it from me for those who 
Honor me, I will honor. The way you respond to God is the way God responds to you. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. I don't want to read all the causes that followed. The days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house. He told him, your two sons, Ovni and Phineas, will die the same day. After God sent this on a no man of God, God then raised someone, the little boy, to go tell him the same story. And he said, it's God. Let him do what he wills. And he did it. The way you respond to God is the way God responds to you. The Lord Jesus in the Beatitude affirmed the same principle in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Last Sunday, we demonstrated that God did not extend mercy to David because he was lucky. No, it was because he first sowed the seed of mercy. Twice, he had the, every opportunity to kill Saul, to destroy him. At the end of the day, Saul said, I've been playing the game of a fool. Tell your neighbor, stop playing the game of a fool. He had every opportunity to kill him, but he didn't. He restrained himself. How shall I do this against the anointed of the Lord? He didn't. Even to this Egyptian servant of the Amalekite who was left to die of, is it malnutrition now, of hunger strike, whatever it was, the man had no food for three days and three nights was going to die. David's men saw him. They picked him and brought him to David. David gave out of their own produce, cake, this, that, water for him to regain his strength. And it was a key to his recovery. Don't bypass those God has planted in strategic position for recovering all. You can ignore them. You can say they are nobody. And yet they may be the key to where you are going. It's good to be merciful to people, to show compassion to people, because what you are looking for is not lost. God had preserved everything and much more elsewhere, but he wants to see how you would treat the less privileged. All these people together constitute the first three lessons we have learned from David, or the three courses he went through. Now, let's take one more. And that is verse 28. Apart from being merciful, that's a point I didn't mention last Sunday. David, in the midst of his trials, became extremely humble. He became humble. He became humble. In verse 28 of 2 Samuel, verse 28, 2 Samuel 2, 28, you will save who? The humble people. But your eyes are on the haughty that you may bring them down. You can see in the life of Jesus Christ that he humbled himself even unto death. Peter the apostle wrote to the church, he said, you younger people submit yourself to the older and one another submit yourself to one another because God receives the proud and he gives grace to the humble. You can't win by righteousness except you're willing to be humble, to recognize the sovereignty of God that is not because you are smart, it's not because you fast, it's not because you pray, it's not because you give, that God is a merciful God who has designed your own syllabus, taking you on a course or in training for righteousness so that you can fully represent him and he can give you responsibility for his kingdom on the face of of the earth. I love the way the message translation translated everything that David went through. Second Samuel chapter 22, beginning from verse 21 to 28 in the message translation. God made my life complete. Hello. God made my life complete when I place all the pieces before him, the good, the bad, the ugly, the low moments, the down moments, the high moments. He placed everything before God. God made my life complete when I placed all the pieces before him. When I cleaned up my act, he gave me a fresh start. 
Indeed, I've kept a lot to God's ways, haven't taken God for granted. Tell your neighbor, don't take God for granted. Every day I review the ways he walks. I try not to miss a trick. I feel put back together and I'm watching my step. God wrote, and that's going to apply to somebody today. God wrote the text of my life when I opened the book of my heart to his eyes. You stick by people who stick with you. The way you respond to God is the way he responds to you. You are straight with people who are straight with you. May you stick with God. May you be straight with him. May you not be crooked and, and walk wickedly. In the name of Jesus, I pray that grace to operate not in wickedness, but in righteousness will be your portion. In Jesus' mighty name. Friends, true grace is contingent upon humility. Peter says, so. he said, this is the true grace in which you stand. After you have suffered a while, God will settle you, establish you. This is the true grace in which you stand. Don't confuse grace with lasciviousness and just live carelessly and think God will show up. No, you may have to suffer for a while because you are following righteous principles, but at the end of the day, you will win my righteousness. Can I hear amen? amen? Now let's do the fourth course. The fourth course David took during his training in righteousness. Beloved, in almost every field of endeavor, especially a field of study worldwide, you have both the theory and the practicals. Science students will know more about this. Even law students have moot court trials. It was our practical. The theories you learn in teachings like this will eventually be deployed by you in the midst of storm, like a pilot who had mastered his art and he has been trained. Even in the midst of storm, he's not looking at the storm, he's looking at his instrument. He's not bewildered and overwhelmed by, by all the things happening in the midst of storm. He knows if he keeps his focus on the instrument, he will land safely. So in the midst of storm, in the midst of vicissitudes of life, when you face ugly circumstances, in real life situation, God will have taken you through practicals that will toughen your muscle and prepare you for such things in future. Can I hear amen? amen. Mm. We want to go to the practical fields that God took David to in nine different locations within and out of Israel. In the course of his training, I wish I'd read a book on this. Maybe I'll be more coherent than I am today, but this is what the Holy Spirit I put in my heart to teach the church that when you saw him being taken from place to place, he was not going on an adventure. No, he was going through practical training in different fields within and outside of Israel. The first field when he fled from Israel, from Saul, I beg your pardon, and when he fled from the presence of Abimelech, where he pretended to be mad by throwing saliva on his beard, the first place he went was the cave of Adullam. The cave of Adullam. 1 Samuel 22, verses 1 and 2. These things that you read are not decorative accessories to fill space in the Bible. There's a reason for them. Pause to ask the Holy Spirit questions. What is, the, what is he doing? Or what was he doing in the cave of Adullam? 1 Samuel 22, verses 1 and 2. David therefore departed from there and escaped to where? To the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house I did, they went down there to him where? In the cave of Adullam. Verse 2. And everyone was in distress. Everyone was in debt. And everyone was discontented gathered to him. I tell people, 
that if God will, will put Davidic anointing upon you, the rich, the famous, the, the men of valor will not be the first to be attracted to you. It will be those in debt. Those who are distressed, completely discontented like Nigerian citizens, they will become your port of call to fix their lives first. God will give you the raw materials of what you will have to do with the entire nation when opportunity presents itself. Those in debt, those discontented, those distressed, gather to him. You may be wondering, what is the reason for the cave of Adulam? Adulam means testimony. Adulam means testimony. You cannot have a testimony without a test. The reason you are given a testimony after leaving school or a course of study is to show how you feared in your course of study. You will recall it was in this cave of Adullam that David himself tested the ruggedness of three of his statue men when he longed for the water of the well of Bethlehem at the gate surrounded by the Philistines. Not only was he sure that they were going to get a testimonial following the test, David established from that moment on, you can read the, the, the story of the mighty men of David, that their promotion will not be based on longevity, how long they have been with him, but on productivity. First Chronicles chapter 11, beginning from verse 15. First Chronicles 11, 15. Now three of the church chief went down to the rock to David into the cave of Adullam, and the army of the Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephim. David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David said with longing, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. You know the Pharisees, I mean, the, the garrison of the Philistines was there, and you are asking them to go bring you water? So the three broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. <laughs> Nevertheless, David would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. And he said, Far be it from me, O my God, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of these men who have put their lives in jeopardy? For the risk of their lives, they brought it. Therefore, I will not drink it. These things were done by the three mighty men. By the time the three mighty men were returning, blood was dripping everywhere, but not inside the water. They fought, they got the water, and they brought him. Friends, let me tell you this. Progress in life involves risk taking. If you can't take risks, <laughs> you can't attempt great things for God. Uh -huh. Promotion in the kingdom is not by longevity. I got born again in, in the year 1919. No, no, no. It is by productivity. I want you to look through the life of David and see how many times he had to take risks. Those who are not willing to take risks may as well die in their comfort zone. May that not be your portion in the name of Jesus. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Queen Esther, Mordecai, and a host of others were all risk takers. Esther said, if I perish, I perish. She was taking a risk. If you are not willing to take a risk, you cannot even venture into business. Because business is risk. Everything about business is risky. From the cave of Adullam, the next <laughs> stop for David was Mishpah of Moab. From the cave of Adullam, David relocated to Mishpah of Moab and dwelt there in the stronghold of Moab, where his great-grandmother, the legendary, legendary Ruth, 
came from. First Samuel 22, 3 to 4. Then David went from there to Mizpah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and mother come here with you till I know what God will do for me. Many of you want everything to line up. You want to really, really not take any risk. And you just want everything to line up before you take the first step. David said, I really don't know what God will do with me. I didn't ask for the anointing, the means of my brothers. I didn't ask to be king of Israel. Look at the trouble I've gotten just by defending Israel against Goliath. I don't know what God would do to me. But let my brothers, let my father, let my mother stay with you. So he brought them before the king of Moab and they dwelt with him at the time that David, all the time that David was in this stronghold. Moab means of his father, of his father, which can be interpreted in pidgin English as Nami Bonam, Nami Givan Bele. I'm sure you know about the sensuous relationship between Lord and his two daughters that produced Ammon and Moab. I'm not about to delve too much here into spiritual DNA of David or tinker with a crack in the wall of David's moral fiber that produced his character flaws. It's okay to start your field practicers in the cave of Adulam, which means testimony. But if you are going to sustain that testimony, you may have to check your roots. Romans chapter 11. It's critical that you check your roots. It's critical that you take your history. Familiar spirits are looking everywhere to say you're the same product that your ancestors bought. Do you understand me? Okay. In Romans chapter 11, 16 to 18. For if the first fruit is holy, the lamp is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Now, have you ever uh, considered looking at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He has a good part. He has the evil part. Do you know many will be deceived that eh, since his tree of knowledge of good and evil, I will take the only good part. I will not take the evil part. It is the same root that supply both. When you are rootless, you become fruitless at the end of the day. God will take you to Moab to locate your roots, because if you don't do so quickly, you may struggle through life not appreciating the need to be firmly rooted in Christ. Look down your family line and see the crisis there and see them haunting you and see you repeating them. God is taking you to your own Moab so that you can discover your root and then relocate yourself and be rooted in Christ. The Yoruba say, Kokorotunje for Lare Folua. Lamentations put it in a very straight manner. Lamentations chapter 1, 8 to 9. Lamentations 1, 8 to 9. Jerusalem has sinned gravely, therefore she has become vile. All who honored her despise her because they have seen her nakedness verse 9 uncleanness is where kokorotunje for lare for uncleanness is in her skirts she did not consider a destiny therefore a collapse was awesome if you are not driven by destiny you will be driven by what others give you to do 
The moment you are not purpose driven, others will give you fresh assignment to latch onto and to begin to embark upon, and yet it's got nothing to do with your destiny. What's your name? Jacob. I check my record. That's not your name. Your name is Israel. Who called you Jacob? Being called Jacob has already made you a supplanter even from your mother's womb. And now the struggle continues. But in my record, you are a prince with power. You have power with God and power with men, and you have prevailed. He will continue to bear Jacob for the rest of his life if God did not root him. Look at the man called, uh, what's his man? The man that was born out of sorrow. Oh, remember his name, Jabez. How can you give birth to a child and say, your name is Jabez? Because his mother gave birth to him in pain. He said, this pain is too much. Your name is Jabez. Do you remember that Rachel almost placed that trouble on Benjamin? What did he call him? Huh? Benoni, son of my sorrow. She was dying. And the father said, of the 11 brothers or sons in my house, all of you mothers named them. This one, I'm accepting responsibility. I'm going to refuse your death wish. His name is not Benoni. His name is Benjamin. His name is Benjamin. When I was born, according to to Islamic heritage, my father gave me the name of his grandfather, Sindiku Bakari. Do you understand me? I became the Bakari to my family. That's why they call me Babagba. Nobody could mention my name, but I got to school. And Olu Enitilo, Isaac Enitilo began to call me Sindiku, Sundoko, Sandaka, Sendeke. I said, this name has to change. Nobody pleaded with me. I went back home and said, were there other names given to me when I was born? They said, yes, your father named this. My grandfather named this. I changed my bag to Baba Tunde. I took Bolan from my father's, the name they gave to me, and I changed my name myself to Bolan Baba Tunde. Bakari. Left to my father, I should have been Bakari, Bakari, because he gave me Bakari as a name. That was why nobody could call me by that name in that family. They call me Baba, Baba. But you old Lati Are you still here? Now, I'm not asking you to go change your name if God is not asking you to do that. But if you call a child Benoni, he must have some significance. If you call that child Benjamin, he must have some significance. Benjamin was called Benoni and Benjamin because he was a type and shadow of Jesus Christ that will be born in Bethlehem. He will be a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief, but when he finishes his work here, he will sit on the right hand side of the Father. Does your name have a meaning? If your name does not have a meaning, go to God. Maybe he will show you the real meaning. I like your name, Olowo Dollar. And if you really want to twist it, we say Olowo Dollar. So from now on, I will not collect Naira from you. I will only collect dollar. Madam, please say amen. amen. Thank you. We have done you in today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh-huh. Colossians chapter 2, you must be rerouted in Christ. Every one of you must relocate yourself back in Christ. Family troubles could pursue you all the days of your life. And all you need to do is to relocate so that you don't suffocate. Second, I mean, Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 to 10. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, and according to the basic principles of the word, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him 
who is the head of all principality and power. There is nothing more to add to what Christ has done in our life. When he said it is finished, truly, it was completely finished. There's nothing more to add. From the stronghold of Moab, David and his men relocated to the forest of Hereth. They relocated to the forest of Hereth. First Samuel 22, 5. I'm making this easy for you. Diligent study. And I trust God that you take note of everywhere God took David to for practical training. First Samuel 22, 5. Now the prophet God said to David, do not stay in the stronghold that was in the stronghold of Moab, Depart and go to the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. This new location is very interesting. According to Jewish tradition, and please don't just take my word for it. You can Google and find Hereth and look for it. It will tell you the pronunciation and it will tell you what happened there. It was in the forest of Hereth that David wrote his most popular psalm, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When you study, you discover that Ereth, though called a forest, was a dry place where no vegetation could grow, yet God came through for David. The forest of Ereth became the forest of his freedom. If God could feed David in a desert as he did for Israel in the wilderness, then he can sustain you and sustain me in any situation or location we find ourselves. Hereth, the Lord is a shepherd. I shall not want. It looked that everything was bare, dry, everything. And yet God sustained him and all his men there. If God came through for David, in the name of Jesus, as you listen to me today, will come through for you. The fourth location, from the forest of Ereth, David relocated to the city of Keilah. After helping the city by fighting and defeating the Philistines that came, that came against the city. 1 Samuel 23, 1 to 5. Is this boring you? Are you enjoying this? I'm showing you his field practicals. God was taking him from place to place. You'll find out why. This is how he fixed his life. The circumstances you are complaining about and you want to jump out of the boat is unnecessary. Just stay and ask what is the reason for the season I'm going through. He has a reason. He has a purpose. When men will rise up against you, he has a purpose. He has an assignment that he wants to commit to your hand that he can commit your hands where you are presently located. Then they told David, saying, Look, the Philistines are fighting against Keila and they are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Keila. <laughs> but David's men said to him, Look, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord once again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to trouble zone, trouble spot, difficult terrain. Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah. And fought with the Philistines, struck them with a mighty blow, and took away their livestock. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Can I give you some insight here? Are you ready for this? Fasten your seatbelt. Are you sure? Because we are about to enter into storm. Are you ready? You can hear the pilot telling you, fasten your seatbelt. We are about to enter into some storm. Kehila means citadel. Woo. Did God bring us here? Are we being mocked? 
Are people not tongue lashing us? Welcome to the citadel. <laughs> it was here that King Saul thought that David was locked in and could not escape from his hand because the town had gates and bars. But David's reliance upon God and his default, his, his ability to constantly seek God's direction, build him out. 1 Samuel 23, 6 to 8. Now it happened when Abiathar, the son of Abimelech, fled to David at Keilah, that he went down with an effort in his hand. And Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah. So Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand, for has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars, citadel. Then Saul called all the people together for war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. When David knew that Saul plotted evil against him, he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the effort here. Then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has suddenly heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the man of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? <laughs> o Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then David said, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver you. Dear friends, David and his men, about 600 arose and departed from Keilah and went wherever they could go. No fixed address. <laughs> Do you understand me? You can see when he dedicated the house that Iram built for him, the king of Tyre. Because he didn't live in the palace of Saul. He lived in the house that was built for him by the king of Tyre. He said there the dedication, tears may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. You claim the scripture, but you have no experience. You don't know what birth it. Do you understand me? <laughs> hey. Tell your neighbor, welcome to the citadel. In every citadel, there are inhabitants of Keilah. They will repay you evil for the good you have done for them. And if you are going to <laughs> try to walk in victory, it is better for you not to get hurt badly by expecting that those you are good to we pay you back in kind. I've seen all kinds of rifles and all kinds of dagger, even by those who had benefited from our ministry turning against us because we have come into the citadel. But because we rely upon God for everything we have done, we seek him constantly, we will always escape unhurt from their evil machinations in the name of Jesus. I want to encourage you, let God be your rewarder, and you not be so disappointed by those who return evil for good. A word is enough for the wise. From the city of Keilah, the fifth location, David relocated to the wilderness of Zeb. He came to the wilderness of Zeb. The word Zeb actually means mouthful falsehood. Is a place of flow, but what will be flowing will be falsehood. It's a mouthful falsehood. Here in the wilderness of Zeb, Jonathan came to David, just as I did to you this morning. You didn't expect it, you didn't plan for it. And I start telling you, we are going to be strategic partners. Somebody had done that to me when I was in the US. When we opened our ministry, and we started flourishing. He said, from today, we will connect with you and we'll give a tithe to support your ministry. He didn't give me one cobalt. Not one time. I won't mention who. So I've given you 
Words of encouragement. Even if I've not put a dime in your hand, do you trust that I will deliver? Do you doubt me? No, because there is character. But here comes Jonathan, which is mouthful falsehood in 1 Timothy 23, 14 to 18. First Timothy, I mean, first Samuel, I beg your pardon, not Timothy. First Samuel 23, 14 to 18. And David stayed in the strongholds in the wilderness and remained in the mountains in the wilderness of Zeb. Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hands. So David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Zeb in a forest. Then Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand in God. How did he strengthen his hand? Listen. And he said to him, do not fear. For the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Even my father Saul knows that. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. And David stayed in the woods, and Jonathan went to his palace. <laughs> and let's make covenant. You do the suffering, I do the enjoyment. I'll be next in command. When God has delivered you, but me, I can't sleep in the forest. It is in the wilderness of Zeb that you begin to learn that the part of destiny is a lonely part. <laughs> oh Lord, help me. Can I stop? Just like the inhabitants of Keila, the Sevites now ganged up with Saul. To destroy David. They plotted to deliver David to Saul. And Saul regarded their act towards him as being compassionate. 1 Samuel 23, 19-23. If you are David, you will start now cursing the day you are born. Because those you are good to gang up against you. Those you thought... Uh, uh, will realize what trouble you are going through will gang up against you. All of a sudden, left, right, and center, you seem to be alone. Then the Sivites came up to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is David not hiding with us in strongholds in the woods, in the hill of Achilla, which is on the south of Jeshimon? And David, therefore, O king, come down according to all the desire of your soul to come down, and our power shall be to deliver him into the king's hand. And Saul said, Blessed are you of the Lord, for you have compassion of me. May your compassion not be given to the enemy of those anointed by God. Amen. In the name of Jesus. He said, Please go and find out for sure and see the place where his heart out is and who has seen him there. For I'm told he's very crafty. Sit therefore and take knowledge of all the locking places where he hides. And come back to me with certainty, and I will go with you. While Saul was plotting with the Sivites, David and his men had relocated to the rock in the wilderness of Maon, or Maon, M A O N. 1 Samuel 23 24, they were plotting to destroy, to destroy him, but he relocated into the wilderness of Maon. So they arose and went to Ziv before Saul, but David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon in the plain of the south of Jeshimon. Okay? Maon means the house or place of sin. If God has fixed the cracks in your life in Moab, if you have been to the cave of Adullam to understand the testimony of God, he has brought you to Moab to show you your roots so that you can be rooted in him. Then he would test whether you have passed or you have understood all he has been teaching you. So he brought him to Maon, the house or place of sin. This was the operational base of Nabal, the husband of Abigail. You know the rest of the story in 1 Samuel 25. 
that David sent his men to go to Nabal that had been given free security services to them. And he understood they were sharing their goat or their sheep. He said, would you give some to your servant, David? And he said, when you get there, greet him. Peace to you. Peace to your house. And peace to all that you have. He said, greet him that way because he, do, he lives in prosperity. And David came, his servants came, and he insulted them. And David said, the Lord do more so to me. If by this time tomorrow, there will be any male that pisses by the wall. Women don't do that. It's men. They can do it anywhere. If there's any male that pisses by the wall in his house, I will kill all of them before they break. They gathered. But one of the servants told Abigail, a dove that was dwelling in a vulture's nest, and said, Abigail, <laughs> your whole family will be wiped out because Nabal had insulted David, who provided free security service for us. Are you still here? Yes, sir. Don't lose your concentration, please. Please, it's critical that you get this. I'm not wasting your time. This is the place where God will test whether or not you take laws into your hands and you become vengeful instead of understanding that vengeance is the Lord's. David was ready to pay back in his own coins to labor. But Abigail did not let that happen. Mm. 1 Samuel 25, 2-3. Now there was a man in Meron whose business was in Carmel, and the man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep, 1,000 goats, and he was sharing his sheep in Carmel. The name of the man was Nabal, the name of his wife, Abigail, and she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance. Why would such a woman marry such a nuisance? But the man was harsh and evil in his doings. It was the household, uh, it was of the house of Caleb. He, he, he just bought package without checking the content. He bought a pig in the pork. No, check the content. Check the content. Don't just jump. David would have committed the heinous crime of revenge here, but for Abigail. I'm not going to teach detailedly into that because you know these things, but here is a way of escape when you let go and you put everything in God's hand. While Saul was about to kill him, while he was a man, God distracted Saul. First Samuel 23, 24 to 28. He caused the Philistines to invade the land of Israel. It was here in Meon that Saul would have caught up with David. Hence, this place is called the Rock of Escape. So they arose and went to see before Saul. But David and his men were in the wilderness of Meon in the plain of the south of Jeshimon. When Saul and his men went to seek him, they told David, therefore he went down to the rock and stilled in the wilderness of Meon, read on, and when Saul heard that, he pursued David in the wilderness of Meon. Can you see how close he was? He would have destroyed him there. If he had gone to destroy the seed you sow, you reap the harvest. Then Saul went on one side of the mountain and David and his men on the other side of the mountain. So David made haste to get away from Saul. So for Saul and his men were encircling David and his men to take them. That's what vengeance does to you. He has only one shape. It's not a square. It's not a circle. The shape of revenge is boomerang. You bind yourself and tie yourself. But a messenger came to Saul saying, hurry and come for the Philistines have invaded the land. Therefore Saul returned from pursuing David and went against the Philistines, so they called that place the Rock of Escape. I want you to stand to your feet and to begin to pray. May you always locate your own Rock of Escape every time the enemy pursues you. I want you to pray. You've been sitting for a while. Pray, pray. Open your mouth. Lord, show me the Rock of Escape. Rock of Ages cleared for me. Let me hide myself in you. 
no matter how hot the pursuit of the enemy is, always show me the rock of escape in the name of Jesus. My life is hidden with Christ in God. Rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide my soul in you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I'm almost through. Please be seated. From the rock of escape in the wilderness of Meon, David relocated to the stronghold in the wilderness of Engedi. Engedi, a place called the Rocks of the Wild Goats. Engedi. Engedi means the fountain of happiness. It was here that David first spared Saul. You know the story in 1 Samuel 23, 28, 29. That's where it was located. 1 Samuel 23, 28 to 29. Therefore Saul returned from pursuing David and went against the Philistines, so they called the place the rock of escape, verse 29. Then David went up from there and dwelt in strongholds at Engedi, which means fountain of happiness. First Samuel 24, verse 1, who pursued him to Engedi. Now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, take note, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Uh -huh. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. Look, 3,000 men against 600 people with David. They were outclassed, outnumbered. And then the king wanted to ease himself. So he left 3,000 men and went to a cave because he was not in the palace to use his WC <laughs> and his role, like that of the first minister of finance in the Federal Republic, in the First Republic. You know his name? What's his name? I didn't mention name. His robe was long. And David came close to him and caught his garment. But that shows his sensitivity. His heart smote him. He had the opportunity to kill him. The cotton, his garment was too much of a burden to him. He said, nah, this is not right. There were people around him that said, this is the day. The Lord has truly delivered your enemies into your hands. I will not stretch my hand against the anointed of the Lord. <laughs> well, you read the rest of the story in 1 Samuel 24 down to verse 22, you get the gist of how he spared the life of Saul. From Engedi, David relocated to the hill of Aquila. Say, I'm doing your work for you. I pray you go and sit down. You begin to see why God is taking you from place to place, and it looks tough. Don't die in your comfort zone. Don't die in your comfort zone. 1 Samuel 26, verse 1 to 12. Now the Sivites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is David not hiding the high hill of Aquila opposite Jeshimon? All right. Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Zim. I've read that. Go on, sir. And Saul encamped in the hill of Aquila, which is opposite Jeshimon, by the road. But David stayed in the wilderness. And he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. Give me verse, about verse 10. David sent out spies and understood that Saul had indeed come. David said all this, go on. I'm looking for something here. Take the spear, the jog. David, David, for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. That was what happened in Engedi. I'm looking for Aquila. Whoa. Where is Aquila? I didn't see Aquila. Can you, can I get my Bible? First Samuel 26. I want to see where I relocated to Aquila there. Mm. 
that's it, verse 1. He came to Saul at Gibeah. Is David now hiding in the hill of Akila? Thank you. I jumped in while I was reading. Akila means there's hope in her. My hope is in her. I want you to put together Engedi and Akila. If you put it together, the fountain of happiness and great hope is located in overcoming evil with good. The fountain of happiness and great hope is in overcoming evil with good. One of these days when I get there, I'll be preaching on the subject, doing good to those who run to you. That you go out of your way to just bless them. Out of your way. They armed you, they hurt you, they wanted evil to happen to you, but you rise above their evil and do good to them. <laughs> Romans chapter 12, you must overcome evil with good. 17 to 21, write it down. You must constantly overcome evil with good. Do not repay evil with evil. This is the basis of the message I preached here in December 2022 that's now being used to launder the image of one of the 2023 presidential hopefuls. When you do good to those who wrong you, the blessing of God's goodness will never depart from, your, from you and from your household. You wait and see what will happen between now and 2023. It doesn't matter if they take the tape out of context and use it to promote themselves. Some people are saying you need to reply. You need to let them know. I, say, I don't need to do all that. I put the pieces of my life in God's hand and he knows what he would do with my life. But I have a song. Are you bored? It was my friend who sang the song. You know my friend? What's his name? Thank you. To banle kusi wa Ti wa banle jo si e Ore mi inye oburu To banle kusi wa Ti wa banle jo si e Ore mi inye oburu O shupa la ye ore o In she la ye mi yi ore o I wa tota lo ye kama hu Toriko seni to mojola O shupa la ye ore o In she la ye mi yi ore o I wa tota lo ye kama hu Toriko seni to mojola Ono lo ji o Eruma ni baba Esha ye jaja o ni tori ola o. Bo je wa lolo ni olo ti re kodara. E lo mi rambo ti o lo jola. Ye madon wo. Rara madon wo. Ye madon wo. Ron ti o la o. Ye o. I'm coming to the night location. And you'll be on your way home. Finally David fled. He fled. He said, Saul will kill me one day. He left Israel territory completely and he fled to Ziklag. David fled to Ziklag where himself and his men became so desperate and operated as bandits and terrorists. Desperate people do desperate things. This is one area of David's life that the faith movement and protagonists of positive thinking and confession would like to sweep under the carpet. But God had it recorded for our learning. Ziklag means pressed down, shaking together, running over. It was here that David lost all that he had acquired, including all that he gathered through banditry and terrorism. Their friend, what goes round, comes round. Every city, every town that David would enter, sir, he killed every man, male or female, destroyed them so that Akish would not know. And he said, where have you gone? I said, I went to the southern territory of Judah. He became a terrorist. His name, his name changed from David, the son of Jesse, to David Boko Haram. It's one of my sons, Tapia Adebayo, who told me that. He said, when he had that message, he suddenly realized that Boko Haram is not new. You would never think of the man who wrote almost a third of the book of Psalms 
doing this. But desperate people do desperate things. He had to survive. He had 600 people. We are not looking at the root of terrorism. Now, if there is terror, it's because there is error. Saul drove him out of his heritage. He had to survive. Well, he wanted to join Achish to go fight Israel. The war leaders rejected him. By the time he returned to Ziklag, everything he had acquired was pressed down, shaken together, burnt up completely. He wept till he had no more power to weep. There was an implosion about to take place in the camp of David when his men said, let's stone him to death because of the anguish of their wives and their children they have carried away. In the midst of that distress, when he had wept with, 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 without any power to continue to weep, he encouraged himself in the Lord is God. And he said, bring me the effort. Shall I pursue? Shall I overtake? Shall I recover all? And God said, pursue. You will surely overtake and recover all. In the process of pursuing was when they found the Egyptian servant of Amalekite who became the key to the recovery. Brothers and sisters, please note three important lessons in the life of David. One, every time David was face to face with danger or major crisis, he sought divine direction. I appeal to you by the message of God from this day forward. Do not join those who say only God is left for us to consult now. It's not your last result. It's your first result. Stop carrying people here, there, there without consulting God first. Consult him first. Tell your neighbor, whatever takes you to the top, we have to sustain you at the top. If intercession takes you to the top, intercession will sustain you there. Don't stop praying, don't stop studying, don't stop seeking the face of the Lord. Number two, for those who can discern from all that I've shared so far, it took being emptied from vessel to vessel for God to heal all the cracks in the life of David. It was being poured from vessel to vessel, being emptied for the dregs of sin, for the dregs of weaknesses to be sifted from the life of David, or else it would have been at ease like Moab. That's why he was taken to Moab. You, the reason they were like that, it was a life of ease. They gave him alcohol. He drank into stupor. Did they, did they force him to drink? He drank and he drank. I mean, please. You, you mean the man was so drunk that he slept with his daughter he didn't know? You can buy that. So his daughter's raped him. You can buy that. He said, let's give him wine to drink so that I will go in tonight and sleep with him. And he became pregnant. He said, next, the next following night is your portion. We'll get him drunk again. Did they force him? He was in a dream that Peter saw a child that came from heaven. He said, rise and kill. He said, I'm a Jew. You are God. I've never eaten things like this in his dream. If someone said he's drunk and he slaps you, slap him twice. He will wake up. Peter sober will pay for the misdeeds of Peter drunk. You understand me? God had to take him back into all days and pour him from vessel to vessel, from vessel to vessel, so that it would not be like Moab that has been at ease from his childhood. Jeremiah 48. Jeremiah 48. 9 to 13. I'm stretching you but you get benefits from it. Give wings to Moab, that she may flee and get away, for our cities shall be desolate without any to dwell in them. Curse is he who does the work of the Lord deceitfully. 
and causes he who kills back his sword from blood. Moab has been at ease from his youth. He has settled on his dregs and has not been emptied from vessel to vessel, nor has he gone into captivity. What will God do? Therefore, his taste remained in him, and his scent has not changed. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I shall send him wine workers who will tip him over and empty his vessels and break the bottles. If David was not emptied from vessel to vessel, from this place to that place to that place, that he had to rely totally upon God, he forgot all about his skills, he forgot about killing Goliath, he forgot about stepping into stardom, all of a sudden, he was in the wilderness, he was in the cave, and everything was stripped of him as, except these men who were in dead distress, discontent, who were ready to kill him by stoning him. He was poured from vessel to vessel so that he could be delivered. Well, for the sake of my friend, you permit me to come to course number five is one of the smallest courses that he took. When David had mastered his training in righteousness, he became a local and global icon. This is for you, sir. I know you are typing, but if you don't mind, I will respectfully ask you to rise up. And I will ask you, ma'am, to please rise. Thank you. After David had mastered his training in righteousness, he became a local and global icon. He became the moral compass for his nation and other nations of the earth. Second Samuel chapter 22, verses 44, 45, and 46. This is what David said after he had been poured from vessel to vessel. After he had been deprived of all that he ever labored for, becoming an icon in his own land. They were singing, you have killed Saul, has killed thousands, you have killed 10,000. He became a, 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 an icon. <laughs> and they chased him away from what looked like what he labored for. At, At the, the end, end of the day, this is what David said. You have also delivered me from the strivings of my people. You have kept me as a head of the nations. Hold on. A people I have not known shall serve me. <laughs> the foreigners submit to me. As soon as they hear, they obey me. The foreigners fade away and come frightened from their hideouts. I know God has spoken to you, sir. And you have been following him. But I want to tell you what he puts in my spirit. And I'm doing this so publicly so I can be held accountable. You see what I just read? Those who major in deliverance will tell you that that passage is for causing demons to manifest so that they can be cast out. You see they are Eyes like global shark, one not I are your palito. Is that not so, brother? Body, why that the kuro maybe call off you one? Uh, go bro, I are your palito. And then they will be telling Jim, come out, come out. No, this is about foreign missions, sir. It is to go to territories where Christ is not preached, where it's not known. And they will respond to you because you are sent. Micah, that passage has nothing to do with devils. This is the destiny and the future exploit of global, global, global mission in the name of Jesus Christ. Give me Micah 7, 16 to 17. I want you to see. The nation shall see and be ashamed of all their might. They have been given their strength to this God of sun, God of moon, and all kinds of foreign gods that have been serving. The nations shall see and be ashamed of all their might. They shall put their hand over their mouth. 
Their ears shall be deaf. They will turn deaf ears to demons that once held them bound. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall crawl from their holes like snakes of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear because of you. Hey, read on. Is that the end? They will be afraid because of you. Not a oh, whole. Who is God like you, pardoning iniquity, passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. You are going to be vessels of mercy and God will begin to send you to territories that you don't even speak their language. But you'll be so apostolic and grace, apostleship and grace is deposited into your life that those territories will open. Those who are in the caves will come out. They will turn deaf ears to their foreign gods. They will fear God because of you. Because of you, they will fear God. They will turn to Christ. No evil shall befall you. Missionaries are sent and killed. That's not your portion. You are going to live for Christ and you are going to cause people to live. You become the head of nations. You become a global icon. You become locally relevant, globally relevant in the name of Jesus. And help will come from east, from west, from north, and from south. And global mission will become a force to reckon with. This is what God spoke to me. This is what I've spoken in the open. And may God confirm with his word. Is one with signs and wonders following. It's just the beginning of your life. Your latter end will greatly increase at your beginning. In the name of Jesus Christ, you will see the desire of heart upon the nations of the earth and the Lord God Almighty. By the time you finish strong here, you will say, Welcome. Thou faithful, thou honest, thou man of integrity, woman of integrity, faithful in my assignment. Enter into the joy of the Lord, your God. God bless you, sir. Stand to your faith. Stand to your faith. David became a global icon. Nations feared him because he was poured from vessel to vessel. It's time to fix Nigeria. Do you understand me? It's time to fix Nigeria. All the pouring from vessel to vessel. My son, Delia Oshumakinde, sent me a photograph. If I have the time next week, I will show you. I've just finished doing Save Nigeria group rally in Abuja. And I was so tired. I removed my shoes and put a bottle of drink and I lay flat on the floor while they are looking for the keys to open my hotel. He said, I took the picture of this that day. You have paid the sacrifice. The price is on the way. Nigeria will be saved. Nigeria will be changed. Nigeria will become great in our lifetime. It's not by struggle. It's not by jumping up and down. It's by God making it happen. This training is yours in the name of Jesus and you will become righteous. You will operate righteously. You will make a difference in a perverse and crooked generation. As God emptied David from vessel to vessel so that it will not be at ease like Moab, everything you are being poured into either two is going to make you the king of nations. You'll be relevant at home. You'll be relevant abroad. In Jesus' mighty name.